All right. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Zoom into Archaeology. This is our, I guess, our bi-monthly, our every other week program that we do online featuring topics in local history and archaeology. And sometimes those topics aren't so local, and that's really fun to learn about as well, things that aren't so close to home. And this was a program that we started last May as a way to bring some of our outreach and education opportunities online when we couldn't meet with people in person. And it's been such a great success that we've decided to continue it. So thank you all for being a part of this program today. My name is Nicole Grenan. I'm the public archeologist for the Florida Public Archeology span Network's Northwest Regional Center. And we're based here out of the University of West Florida and my office is in downtown Pensacola. So that's where I'm joining you from. We got a couple of things just to go over real quick before we go ahead and get started. If you've joined us before, you've probably heard all of these things before, so I apologize. If you're new, I um, just want to remind everyone to keep their microphones muted during the presentation so that way everyone can give their attention only to our speaker today. Also, I'm going to be recording this presentation so that people who aren't able to join us at 3.30 p.m. on a Thursday afternoon can watch the presentation at their convenience via our YouTube channel. So if you don't want your tiny head to be a part of my recording, go ahead and turn your camera off as well. Um, and that will help, again, focus the attention on our speaker and our presentation for today. If you have any questions for the speaker during the presentation, um, we will address those at the end, but you can use the chat function here in Zoom to go ahead and get those burning questions off of your mind ahead of time. Um, and she can address them kind of in the order that they're asked toward the end of the presentation. Let's see, we've got people joining us in the room. That's great. Let's see, there are some of you, I believe, who are here for extra credit at the University of West Florida. I think what we're gonna do for that is towards the end of the presentation, if you'll just type your name um, in the chat box, as well as the class that you're here for, or that your instructor's name or the name of the class. That way I can forward that onto her when, it's, when the presentation is over. But we'll do that closer towards the end. Um, and I can't see when you leave and enter the room, just so you know. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker, Adrienne Walker. She's with the UWF Historic Trust. She's the Arcadia Mill Archaeological Site Manager. I'm in Arcadia, or not Arcadia, Adrian. I'll go ahead and maybe I'll just throw it over to you if you're okay with that. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. And thank you, Nicole, for this opportunity. Um, like she said, I'm the site manager at Arcadia Mill Archaeological Site in Milton. Um, I'm also serving as the interim archivist here at the UWF Historic Trust. Um, and I'm a staff archaeologist here at the Historic Trust. So I wear a few different hats. Um, but normally, I talk so much about Arcadia Mill, which, of course, Arcadia Mill is mentioned in this presentation. But this is going to be something a little different um, with some um, a different topic per se, talking about hush arbors kind of in general, but also pulling in a little bit of evidence from our local sites like Arcadia. So I appreciate being here and hopefully I won't have any technical difficulties. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Let's see if I can pull this off. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that all right. Um, this presentation is called Build with the Spirit, Exploring the Antebellum Practice of Hush Arbors. Um, and I will say this is just scratching the surface. Um, there is so much, I think, more to be learned about these. Um, interesting kind of cultural construction. So this is really just serving as a broad overview. I need my slides to advance. There we go. So this will serve as a broad overview about the practice of hush arbors by enslaved people. And I'll talk some about the differences in terminology that we see um, and how we can learn about these cultural traditions in the historic record or you know, the documentary record, as well as maybe the archeological record too. Um, and so many people are unfamiliar with this practice. I, I certainly was until just a few years ago. Um, an FPAN staff member, Tristan, um, actually came up with the idea to create a public program 
kind of based and surrounding hush arbors and what they are. And he shared this idea with us in Pensacola. And so we've been um, kind of working to do public programming on it. And I will talk about that towards the end of the presentation. So the main question is what is a hush arbor? Um, during the antebellum period, a hush arbor was an outdoor meeting space, usually in secret, where enslaved people could practice religious and cultural traditions, um, usually in the form of praying and singing, but there were also sermons and kind of scripture as well. These sacred spaces were usually wooded and secluded um, and kept from the watchful eye of the overseer or the owner. Um, now we do see some variation, like I said, with terminology and what um, kind of environment you might be referring to if you hear hush arbor or some other iteration. Uh, but these hush arbors usually began with a spiritual and usually the opening spiritual was a joyous one. Um, and they often ended with a spiritual as well. And that's something that we try to emulate with our public program. Uh, so just to touch on the imagery, hush arbors are a little bit obscure, and I will be talking about how we even know about them at all um, today. So I don't have a lot of imagery to share, um, but I do have a few. Um, so just to kind of explain the top uh, left image is of a hush arbor, but more in the architectural sense of it, because in the historic record, we do run into um, where a hush arbor is actually more of a, a structure or an architectural feature, um, whereas the bottom image um, shows more of what the secret or covert version of the hush arbor would have looked like. Um, the ones that were held in the woods kind of out in secret wouldn't have had much structure at all because they basically didn't want to leave any trace that they were there. Uh, so for consistency, I am going to just use the term hush arbor today, um, but we do see so much variation in the historic record. Um, and even, like I said, definitions, whether it's a hush arbor where they were sneaking off into the woods to pray or a hush arbor that was a built structure that was out in the open and known about. Um, so if you get interested in this topic and you try to research it, you will find a ton of variation. We see brush arbor, obvious hush arbor, hush harbor, brush harbor, and so forth. Um, now there is a scholar, Janet Dutzman Cornelius, who wrote um, Slave Missions in the Black Church in the Antebellum South. And she says, or kind of indicates that the term hush arbor is a parallel to the terms brush arbor or brush harbor, which were actually the names that white people gave to their camp meetings or the revivals that they would hold um, usually out of town on the weekends. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about that too, the correlations between these African-American cultural constructions, but also the influences of Protestant religion and white influence of camp meetings and revivals and things like that. Um, in some instances, hush arbors um, incorporated something called a ring shout um, that could lead to trance possession. I'm not gonna get too much into um, the specifics of how people experience these hush arbors because I have not delved that deep into it. Um, if it's even out there for us to learn about, but I do know about the ring shout. It incorporated rhythm and dance and it moved the worshipers into a trance-like state. And that was often referred to as getting the power or quote, being filled with the spirit, which is kind of why I chose the title of today's talk. Um, so like I said, we see them in several different contexts whether it's a built structure or it's out in, um, in the woods sort of in secret. So you do kind of have to flesh out those differences. Um, we see a lot of variation too in the documentary record about religious services in general for enslaved people and what they could and couldn't do. 
Uh, we see examples of owners indoctrinating their enslaved with Adrian, I don't know if you can hear me. It looks like maybe your computer cut out a little bit. Let's give Adrian here a second to, to come back. I'll see if I can get in touch with her. Oh no, I could hear you for a second. Did I lose you? Your video you cut out for maybe the last like, I don't know, minute and a half. Okay. All right, let me- um, Maybe backtrack just a couple sentences. <laughs> where was I? I'm sorry, I don't know. The internet connection is not incredibly stable today. Um, did you guys hear me talk about the ring shout? I think maybe that's right where we were when you cut out. Okay. So sometimes with hush arbors, um, there was something called a ring shout. I'm not going to get too much into the details of some of the things that they actually did at these hush arbors because that's still a little bit unknown and kind of more research to be done. But the ring shout could often lead to a trance possession because they were incorporating rhythm and dance um, and moving worshipers into a trance-like state which is often referred to as getting the power or being filled with the spirit. So that's kind of why I chose the title of this presentation today. Um, we see a lot of variation too in the record about what enslaved people were allowed to do and what they couldn't do in terms of religious um, services. So we see a ton of variation. We see examples where owners were indoctrinating their enslaved people with Protestant views, um, having them attend church with them, um, or even having the preacher come to the big house or to the plantation or wherever they live to preach to them. Uh, we see evidence of owners allowing their enslaved to practice kind of their own religion, whatever that may be, and even having prayer meetings in their cabins, or sometimes we've even seen under an arbor like the structure you see in that image. Um, and then we also see instances in the record where church or religion was not allowed at all, which encouraged the practice of hush arbors or these secret meetings. And in the situations where white owners were providing religious services, the theme was often obey thy master and mistress, you know, be an obedient or good slave, definitely reinforcing or trying to reinforce the institution of slavery and just the peculiarness of it too. Um, there were definite undertones of paternalism and reminding enslaved people to be thankful for their masters, even though we know at the end of the day that these people were held in bondage against their wills. And um, so there was, there was some indoctrinating going on to help reinforce the entire institution altogether. So let's see if my PowerPoint will participate with me. Okay, so how do we know about these hush arbors? How do we know that they even happened? Um, there is some scholarship out there and I this is by no means the extent, I'm sure there's more. Um, there are some books. I referenced the Slave Missions book a little bit ago. Um, they talk about Hush Arbor some. There's also even some master's theses that are starting to become available that do touch on religion or uh, make inferences to Hush Arbors. But the most robust resource that I have found thus far um, is the WPA Slave Narratives. So between 1936 and 1938, the WPA Federal Writers Project uh, sent out of work writers in 17 states to interview ordinary people and to write down their life stories. Uh, so initially there were only four states involved in this project that focused on collecting stories of people who had once been held in slavery. And those states were Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and Virginia. 
the national advisor on folklore and folkways for this project was extremely interested in the materials. And in 1937, he directed the remaining states to also carry out these interviews with ex-enslaved people. Um, so federal field workers were given instructions on what kinds of questions to ask and how to capture even the dialects because clearly people's dialects uh, varied quite a bit whether these the older generation were actually African-born people versus the younger um, people who sometimes were, were born here in the States. And so dialects played a big role um, in these different interviews. Uh, and sometimes they visited more than once to these people's homes and took photographs of these informants and their houses. Um, this program lost funding in 1939. And so the remaining narratives were sent to Washington and the folklore editor for the project finished editing and indexing them. They're all indexed by state and the names are in alphabetical order. Um, and so in 1941, they were completely collected into 17 bound volumes that are in 33 parts known as Slave Narratives, a Folk History of Slavery in the United States from Interviews with Former Slaves. So the fabulous thing about this resource is it's all online. These narratives are all available through the Library of Congress. Um, as well as the images that were taken of these people and their homes, that's all available. Um, like I said, they're broken down by state um, and then alphabetically, um, if there was a large number of in, um, individual interviews. And even better than the fact that they're online and accessible to everyone, they're also searchable. They're in searchable PDF format, which is huge when you're conducting research or you know, trying to get through a large volume of things. So for this presentation, I tried to pick us a, a couple keywords to do searches on. So I searched hush, I searched arbor, brush. I started searching brush to B-R-E-S-H because I was finding with the dialects that sometimes brush was being referred to as brush or it was written down that way. I also searched for church. Uh, and there's other material supplementary um, to this project, and the interview questions are actually available, uh, which is very helpful to understand the flow of these narratives. And before I realized that these questions were there, I kept finding that um, education or being educated and religion or church were discussed together or almost, you know, simultaneously. So I thought I had made this big breakthrough in correlation, thinking that these ex-enslaved people saw such a connection between religion and education, because so often it was discussed about how they weren't allowed to read or write, which means they couldn't read the Bible. Um, but then I found the interview questions and realized that education and um, religion pretty much were asked one after the other. So they asked, did the white folks help you to learn to read or write? And they asked, did the slaves have a church on your plantation? Did they read the Bible? Who was your favorite preacher, your favorite spirituals? Tell about the baptizing, baptize, baptizing songs and funerals and funeral songs. And not every single one of the interviews touches on every single topic or question that's asked. Um, but there's definitely some great information in there, especially about some of the songs. Um, that could really be kind of explored further. I'm gonna go through just a, some examples of the instances where we see Hush Arbor being referred to and the different ways that it can be referred to. So I found multiple instances where the use of Arbor uh, was more structural or architectural and out in the open and known, it was not a secret. Um, we have examples from Alabama, Arkansas, and Georgia. Um, what I found too, and looking through all these narratives is geography often didn't um, make much difference on whether or not hush arbors occurred or were even mentioned. Um, and, and that would make sense because it was all dependent on the slave owner and, the, and what they were willing to allow their enslaved people to do or not do or have access to. 
Um, so these are examples of um, enslaved services that were out in the open and known about. Um, and you will see the example of Bresh Harbor, um, I believe in the Alabama one, which started to tip me off to start looking at different variations and spellings of some of these terms. And the example from Georgia reinforces the idea that services, um, that in, that the services enslaved people held sometimes mixed traditional African ideology with Protestant songs and gospel that was being preached by the white um, congregation. So this one talks about how sometimes they would go and sit behind the trees and listen to white folks church and listen to their singing and preaching and then go back and sing those same songs. And I've seen this in some of the scholarship about Hush Arbors that as time went on, especially as you're getting into the um, mid 1800s, 1840, 1850, the um, religious services that were being held by enslaved African Americans were often by that point a mixture of Protestant or, or white folks church and some of the native um, traditions and songs and things that they would say. So then we have examples of when these hush arbors were not out in the open. Um, and these were um, kind of out in the woods, the sneaking off kind of concept. We have examples from Arkansas, Oklahoma, and North Carolina, um, where these people are talking about sneaking out at night to practice religion. And Sally Carter in Oklahoma, I've seen her quoted several times in other scholarship. She said at night they would slip off and get in ditches and sing and pray. And when they would sometimes be caught at it, they would be whipped. So this is showing that evidence about um, when enslaved people were not allowed to sing or pray even in their own cabins, even on their own time. And so they had to find kind of secretive ways to do it. Um, and when you read through some of these, you, you really can feel the sense that having these hush arbors or having the chance to openly pray um, absolutely like helped them to persevere and to go on. Like this was a very important part of their experience and their resistance. Um, something else that there's kind of a thread throughout these and others um, is the tradition of using a wash pot or like a cook pot to drown out the sound of their singing and praying. And I saw that multiple times throughout um, some of these narratives and another scholarship about how they would take a cast iron cooking pot or wash pot with them into the woods. They would sing and pray into it and it would deaden the sound um, so they couldn't be heard by the master. I've seen other examples too, where sometimes they would take quilts or cloth out and kind of hang it on the boughs of the branches in this little space to really just try to deaden that sound. Um, and that is a very powerful um, image that you can get when you start to really picture what these hush arbors looked like. So I would be remiss if I didn't tie it in somehow to Arcadia or even just on a local level here in Northwest Florida. Um, so the question becomes, is there local evidence of hush arbors or enslaved religious practices? Um, at Arcadia Mill, we've spent the last decade or so really focusing on the enslaved population. We know there were about a hundred enslaved people by um, 1850. And so we've really been exploring what daily life was like for these people. And one of the documents I've worked with that mentions um, enslaved religion is a uh, memoir of sorts that is written by Anna Worcester Dorr. She was born in 1834 and she was the niece of E.E. E. Simpson, who was one of the two main mill owners. E.E. E. Simpson helped build Arcadia Mill and run it um, in the image at the top right, the large big house is his home. And then you can see a cabin off to the right that I'll talk about more in a second. Uh, but Anna Worcester Dorr was the niece of E.E. E. Simpson through marriage. Her aunt was E.E. E. Simpson's first wife who 
um, died of yellow fever not long after they were married. Uh, this door memoir is a tricky one. It was found tucked in the archives here downtown with very little identifying information. There's no date associated with it, uh, but she talks about her mother's death in 1887. So we know that it was at least written after that for her to know that that's when her mother died. Um, so she's born in 1834 and she, you know, talks about her mother dying in 1887. Uh, this probably isn't necessarily a firsthand account. She would have been very young um, at the time of enslaved people living there at Arcadia. And she may have visited, she may have recollections, but she didn't write it down until she was at least 53. So this could be things that her aunt told her too, or was just carried on sort of in the family oral tradition. Um, so it's very, very likely to be passed down, but it corresponds to other documents that we do have. And it talks about how the Negroes were allowed churches of their own, as few cared to attend the white folks meeting. They could not shout and get happy with white folks about and being a very emotional nature preferred to be unrestrained in its expression. So we have to take this with a grain of salt because there's so much bias in the historic record. Um, but this is evidence um, that perhaps the enslaved at Arcadia didn't have to resort to hush arbors and that they did actually get to practice religion um, kind of out in the open. So a question too that we end up with is, can we identify hush arbors in the archeological record? And in theory, the answer would be probably not um, because these were held in secret and they didn't wanna leave any trace behind because they would have been in trouble if they would have been caught. So um, it would be very hard to find an archeological signature. Um, now, if it's the actual kind of structure version or where there were posts in the ground, those are the kinds of things that we can find archeologically. Um, but we find random posts a lot actually, uh, when we know we're kind of in the area of a structure. So we would really need the corresponding material culture um, to help us identify a kind of freestanding hush arbor or arbor structure from that period. Uh, and the image on the screen is actually of an interpretive panel that's at the Arcadia Homestead site. Um, we have Arcadia Mill, uh, which is about 34 acres of the industrial site with a boardwalk and a museum. And then we also have a homestead site that um, is where E. Simpson's first house stood till it burned down. There's now a replacement home from the 1930s that's interpreted. But this is a place where we can interpret the enslaved and the people who really lived at the mill um, working there. So this is an interpretive panel that we have. Um, we've done a lot of excavations on this cabin that was pictured in that other image from the other slide. So you could kind of see the proximity. It's very close to the big house. Uh, the material culture we have found definitely suggests that it's likely to be occupied by enslaved people, probably a domestic slave who serviced the big house or maybe even a nurse or cook that helped look after the Simpson household. Um, we're not entirely certain, but we've done a lot of excavations and we have located all of the brick piers. We've excavated the chimney of the structure. And interestingly, we found a cast iron kettle overturned inside the pier, one of the brick piers. And first off, as an archeologist, you get pretty excited when you find things that seem intentional. Um, so we have to ask, you know, could this have been intentionally buried or placed there as part of a ceremonial, you know, or religious um, belief? And we do find that quite a bit with African-American, um, archeology span with enslaved contexts, we find things placed in certain areas for certain reasons, um, kind of corresponding back to religious traditions. Uh, but also these cast iron cooking pots were incredibly frequent in this time period. They were used in the big house, they were used by enslaved people, everybody was using a cooking pot or a wash pot. So they're incredibly common. Um, 
but it's also that item that was used in Hush Arbor. So um, one cooking pot does not a Hush Arbor make, um, but finding this gave us the opportunity though to interpret Hush Arbors a little bit at Arcadia, even though we can't confirm or deny if they happened there. Um, so we use this opportunity to talk about the kettle that they were used for cooking, but also used for praying and that enslaved people would sing and pray into these kettles to catch the sound. So it did give us a nice interpretive opportunity. So one way that we um, are exploring this idea, this concept, this kind of cultural construction even further is through a public program uh, the Florida Public Archaeology Network and Arcadia Mill um, are, have partnered together in the past to have a program called Admiring the Hush Arbor. And we've hosted it twice. The first one was inside and very intimate at night. Um, the second time we did it, we had it outside, just kind of trying out different things and finding the best way to bring people together um, to learn something new. So. We're working on a third one. It is tentatively scheduled for Saturday, February 26th of 2022. And it will be outside under the large Heritage Live Oak. You can see in the picture on the bottom of the screen, the cabin that I've been talking about sat just beyond that. So this is very sacred space um, and it really lends to a powerful uh, program. And, and basically what it is, it's a, mix of short presentations with speakers, music demonstrations, artistic expressions. We open it and close it with a spiritual sang by a local uh, family here. And, and the hope is just that a variety of people will come together and learn something new in a meaningful way. And so this is, I think, by far one of the most powerful programs that we put on um, and we really enjoy it. So we hope you'll keep an eye out um, for that. We're applying for some grant funds to help uh, support it so we can get some marketing and bring in some really special people from out of town. So we're looking forward to that. And I wanna wrap up this presentation with something that just kind of grabbed at me a little bit. Um, there's two different kind of interesting concepts in African-American culture that I wanted to touch on. Um, so in reading some of this scholarship, I found a reference where a black minister on the Sea Islands, which is off the East Coast, said the expression, let the morning star greet you on your praying ground, is referring to when enslaved people had to sneak off to have these secret prayer places in the woods late at night. And basically they were keeping out a watchful eye for the morning star when they saw the morning star twinkling they knew that morning would follow soon and it was time to get home before they were missed. Um, and something that that really led me to and reminded me of is another concept called day clean, uh, which originated in Africa. Um, these are sort of related, but I just, I couldn't help myself, but kind of wrap it up this way. Um, day clean is just a really interesting concept that I personally think is really neat and I think it transcends ethnicity because I think and just about anyone can find meaning in this. So basically day clean refers to right before the sun rises when the night clouds are clearing away and the first rays of light streak across the sky. And it's when the day is new and the world is made fresh again. And the first time I saw this reference was in a book um, depicted on the right by Cornelia Bailey. And she was the matriarch of Sapelo Island, Georgia. I was very fortunate to get to do field work there and meet Cornelia um, and, you know, get to know who she is. Um, she has since passed, but she lives on through this book. Um, and she talks about this concept that maybe, you know, when enslaved people were brought over to Sapelo, maybe they looked around, they took a deep breath, and said, okay, you know, this reminds me of home, maybe we can go on. And you know, found the strength to make a new beginning or you know, a sign of day clean. So perhaps when enslaved people were leaving these brush hush arbors and seeing the morning star and making their way back just before sunrise, hopefully you know, they felt day clean and felt a renewed strength to 
go on another day. Um, so anyone's interested, the book is phenomenal. You can find it online. It's um, very interesting and covers all aspects of living on the sea islands, but does tie in things like hush arbors. Um, so I was actually surprised to find little nuances of that in that book. So with that, kind of wrap it up and I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody might have. Thank you so much for that presentation, Adrian. That was fantastic. Thank you. <clears throat> A lot of things I didn't know about the hush arbors. I think someone had contacted me when we set this program up and had asked if I meant brush arbor instead of hush arbor. And I didn't really, I, you know, I had to do a little bit of research to answer that question, but I didn't realize there were so many different iterations, you know, of the name and that it really was, you know, adopted differently in different places and by different people, but all had this kind of one theme of, you know, praise tying it together. So really interesting. And like Adrian said, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat box or unmute and ask a question. And if not, I don't know, I have a question maybe to get started or maybe just a question for you. Um, did you, and looking at the slave narratives, I was just curious, did you find anything local to Northwest Florida there? Were there any... WPA folks who were interviewed individuals in Northwest Florida, since we're talking about our area here. So I, there is a Florida um, volume and it, it, what's interesting, I would encourage anybody who has any interest in this time period or slavery or anything like that to actually go look at this resource. I, I'm mad that I didn't have the time to literally read them all because I, I would love to sit and read them. And it's hard, you know, this is hard history. Some of it's very difficult to get through, um, but the, the wealth of information is incredible. And there is a Florida volume. I did not come across anything um, particular to the Gulf Coast. I mean, Jacksonville, I think, showed up. Um, just to kind of prepare for this talk, like I said, I did keyword searches. So I know I probably missed a lot of just really interesting and valuable um, information, but there is definitely a Florida, there's Georgia, Alabama. So it's definitely in our backyard um, and it's all there. So, yeah, it's a document that I knew existed, but I guess I didn't realize there were 17 volumes. I mean, that's a wealth of information. Absolutely. And you can tell some are much larger than others. Um, some like even just like typing in keyword searches, it went through it really quickly. And some, it really took some time because it was tracking through like 400 pages, mm -hmm. um, but they're a great resource. And we've got a comment from Heather in the chat box saying that in who do they do rituals at sunrise. So she kind of thinks that the concept that you talked about toward the end of the presentation has persisted into the 20th century and 21st century now, I guess. Yeah, um, I would certainly, expect that. Um, I mean, if you think about it, even going back to um, early man and Native Americans and some of their traditions um, surrounding sunrise and even like constellations and all of that. So um, I think, you know, some of these broader things like rituals at sunrise or even some of the sayings really transcend time and can thread so many different cultures together. Yeah, and I think it's a great testament, you know, people always ask, you know, how is archaeology and history relevant to our lives today? And I don't think people realize that so many of these traditions and cultural things that we do are rooted in, you know, the decades and centuries before us. So I think it's a really good kind of example of that, too. Thanks for highlighting that, Heather. Any other questions, feel free to type them in or comments, feel free to ask. Um, if you are here for extra credit, you can also feel free to go ahead and type your name and the class for which you are attending in the chat box if you'd like to do that. And I'll get that sent on to your instructor. Um, otherwise, I just wanna thank you again, Adrian, for joining us today. This was fantastic. If you attended today and you think this topic would be of interest to someone else that you know, we do record all of these presentations and put them online because um, I know not everyone can join us at 3.30 on a Thursday. 
Um, and we put them on our YouTube channel, which you could just search Florida Public Archaeology Network when you go to YouTube. We've got a Zoom into Archaeology playlist and a ton of great previous presentations there that we've done. And Adrian's will go up probably on Monday <laughs> once I've got the opportunity to put it up there. Um, but thank you again, Adrian. I really appreciate it. And thank you to all of you for joining us um, this afternoon. We appreciate you being here. We have another Zoom into Archaeology program on Thursday, October 7th. Um, we're welcoming Dr. Leslie Gregorica from the University of South Alabama. She's going to talk about climate change and biological archaeology and Bronze Age. Um, oh, excuse me, got someone in the chat room there. We got Bronze Age. Um, I think Arabia is what she said her topic was going to be on. I need to look up the, <laughs> the title that I had. It sounded really interesting. I know climate change has been a topic that we've really been focusing on here at FPAN, looking at how climate change affects um, historical and cultural resources. So that's going to be a really excellent presentation that ties into the initiatives that we've been doing here. So please do join us for that on October 7th. And if you have to miss it, you can catch it on YouTube as well. So thank you all. Thank you, Adrian. I don't know. Do you have anything you want to plug that you have going on recently? If not, that's fine too. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm usually full of shameless plugs, but I'm really not today. <laughs> I would shamelessly plug our Hush Arbor program. It is a, a ways out in February. Um, yeah. For anyone that's not been to Arcadia, if any of that interested you, it's definitely a place here locally that you can visit and learn more about life of the enslaved and especially in an industrial context. Um, and for anyone that doesn't find that interesting, it's just a nice area in nature with a boardwalk <laughs> and it's actually nice outside. Um, so I encourage you to check out Arcadia and thank you for tuning in. Um, I am by no means an expert on any of this. And I think there's so much to be uncovered and so much to learn and I, I hope that I can make some kind of contribution to the scholarship and, and hopefully everyone learns something interesting that they could share with someone else. So thank you for attending today. Awesome. Yes. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your beautiful Thursday afternoon and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you all. Thanks.